This is the high risk neonate uh, part two. I know you go over hyperbilirubinemia in OB, um, but we go over it again in PEDS. So this is an imbalance of the rate of bilirubin production, which comes from breaking down of the fetal red blood cells. So an imbalance between that production and elimination. And if you remember, it's eliminated through the stool. It's in the bile, put into the, the GI system and dumped out in the stool. So uh, physiologic jaundice, this breakdown of uh, fetal hemoglobin causing this uh, increase in bilirubin usually happens third or fourth day of life. Um, you can have early or late onset related to breastfeeding. Breastfeeding actually uh, makes it um, take a little longer for the baby to clear out the extra jaundice. Uh, pathologic jaundice, this is when the, it happens within the first 24 hours of life. So there is something really going wrong. The fetal hemoglobin shouldn't be breaking down yet um, unless it started breaking down in utero, which then we're really worried about that RH uh, incompatibility between um, mom and baby, which puts the baby at risk now for uh, connectoris, connectorosis, which is brain damage from high bilirubin. This is why we treat it. So things that put the baby at risk, that RH incompatibility or ABO incompatibility. Uh, but the one that does the biggest um, problem is that RH incompatibility. Uh, so when you're doing your nursing assessment, you're going to look at risk factors. What are the babies and the mom's uh, blood types? You're looking for jaundice. And remember, it starts on the head and moves down. So we're really looking at the face and the trunk first. A lot of people will blanch the skin. And when you let go, it should be white or pinkish, and if it's yellow, it's jaundice. And a lot of people use the tip of the nose or um, somewhere on the chest. Uh, and remember, RH incompatibility, um, we're going to see it earlier and more severe. And then we're going to monitor the labs uh, for the bilirubin levels. So the nursing management for this, we want to feed babies early because you get rid of that in stool. And fetal hemoglobin has a shorter lifespan than adult hemoglobin. So it does break down and the liver is immature. It can't bond, um, get that bound into the um, bile and to excrete in the stool very effectively. So uh, the more feeding and the more pooping, the better. If that doesn't work, then we do the phototherapy because the bilirubin gets bound. Sunlight or light, certain waves of light on the skin will bind it, which allows the liver then to put it into the, um, the bile. So uh, we're worried about the unbound bilirubin, not really the bound. The unbound is what can cross that blood-brain barrier, barrier and do brain damage. So a baby who does have those really high levels, um, phototherapy might be tried, but if that's not adequate or the levels are too high and we need to do something faster, they'll do an exchange transfusion. So this, they actually take a syringe of baby's blood out, toss it, give baby a syringe of blood take a syringe of baby's blood out, toss it, give baby a syringe of donor blood. So they're um, not taking so much blood out as to make the baby anemic. They're giving it back, but they're giving back blood that does not have that uh, bilirubin in it um, or the um, sen whatever sensitization issue is going on. Education and support. This RH, if you remember, we can treat this. This is where we have an RH negative mother and an RH positive fetus. We want to prevent the mother be from becoming sensitized against the baby's blood, which means we're going to give her Rogam um, 
any time there's bleeding during the pregnancy or mid-pregnancy and after delivery. So that even if she gets, and that rogram pre prevents her from developing antibodies, becoming sensitized, even if she gets exposed to baby's blood. Uh, a lot of kids, we can treat mild uh, hyperbilirubin at home. We put them on the lights at home. And if you remember, we do need to protect the eyes. Uh, children's, they have a different eye patch rather than putting that burn netting over it to hold it in place. But somehow we need to keep the eyes covered and we want as much skin exposed to the light as possible. They have blankets you can lay under the baby, lights you can put over the baby, um, depending on what's ordered and what your facility has. And then we usually keep a diaper on. A baby who's naked is going to get cold though. So usually we have them inside an isolate or if it's a preterm baby who are more at risk because of that immature liver, uh, they're probably on a warming table to keep them warm. Uh, sit with that. So we want to keep them warm, but we want to make sure we don't get them too warm. And we want to make sure they're getting time being held, being fed, so they can come out of the lights just for short periods for those care activities, changing um, the diaper, feeding, and we want good feeding and good pooping going on. So neonatal infections, um, these can be devastating. They often have very vague symptoms though, so poor feeding or GI problems. A baby who was feeding well stops feeding well. That's a significant change that needs to be reported. Difficulty breathing or a baby having apnea, especially if they weren't and now they start having apneic spells. Bradycardia, increased O2 or ventilator support. So a baby who's been doing well and they're starting to need a little more oxygen or, or we've got to up the ventilator a little bit. Um, sounds like a small sign but it can be um, a big problem so lethargy they're not having their normal wake cycles hypotension uh, temperature changes and on neonates it might go down or go up that hypothalamus that controls your set point isn't very mature so there's no telling which way it will go but a change in temperature skin rash or color change crying and irritability. Um, these are all bad signs. So we're going to do cultures. Generally we do blood, urine, and um, a lumbar puncture to check the cerebral spinal fluid. So we check all of those. Babies are not good at isolating infection, so they get it in one place. It goes to all of them. So even if it started in the urine, it can go to the blood and then into the cerebral spinal fluid and we often do a chest x-ray too because it could have started as pneumonia or settled into pneumonia. Remember you've got to do cultures before you do um, start your antibiotics or you'll have negative cultures and you don't know what's really going on. So get the cultures quickly and then start antibiotics. We don't wait for results to come back. We put them on broad spectrum antibiotics and when results come back, then narrow it down to what's specific uh, to the organisms we found.